So I request uh, uh, Dr. Fikhe uh, Medda, please uh, start the uh, program. Sir. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. So thank you all. Today our college has organized a week's meeting. And today's sole speaker is the distinguished scientist, Professor Parthoprati Majumdar, former director of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, in short, NIBMG, Kollani. Before we get into the technical session, I will now request a respect principal Maharaj, Sami Kamalastanam, to give his welcome address. So, most respected Professor Parthoprati Majumdar, distinguished uh, scientist of NIBMG and also former and founder director of NIBMG and now the, uh, the honorable president of Indian Science Academy. Uh, he is our uh, today's uh, actually speaker and our faculty member, those are present in this Webex platform and also YouTube platform. And to my dear students, those are also present in Webex and also YouTube platform. So we are uh, very, very uh, uh, fortunate that we have uh, uh, got, got the uh, consent of Professor Prathapati Majumdar, distinguished scientist uh, of, uh, of a very unique field. And uh, he will uh, today speak also a very unique topic. Afterwards, uh, Dr. P.K. Penda will tell you. But uh, it, it is uh, very our rare opportunity that uh, Professor Prathapati Majumdar, he is actually amidst us. And uh, all you know that uh, uh, Professor Parshupati Mojumdar, uh, uh, according to the Stanford uh, 2020 assessment, uh, he is the uh, uh, top most 2% uh, uh, scientist uh, from uh, India in the specific field, uh, heredi uh, genetics and heredity. And also he is the only scientist in India. So uh, uh, Professor Mojumdar uh, is, uh, is a very, very unique scientist uh, and uh, a, a rare personality. Uh, and uh, I uh, request all the students, uh, uh, please uh, uh, actually in your chat box uh, post congratulations, sir, so that uh, sir will be get uh, because uh, there is no visual meeting so that uh, we can give, uh, give a big hand, but uh, there is no scope, but we can congratulate sir for his, for his achievement. So with this reward, I uh, actually um, welcome him. I, ex ex I express my heartiest regard and also uh, respect to Professor Parthapati Mojumdar on behalf of this uh, college, on behalf of the all students, on behalf of all faculty members, and on behalf of all other staff members uh, for uh, his uh, kind content uh, for delivering the talk in this uh, beautiful afternoon. And uh, with this few also, I want to say thanks everybody for the different platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Maharaj. Should I get started? Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, just uh, 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 introduction, Professor Midda. Thank you, Maharaj, for your welcome address. Now, let me introduce the speaker. Parthapratim Mojadar is the former director of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, NIBMG Kollani, and president of Indian Academy of Sciences. Professor Mojumdar had his PhD award in 1982 from Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, and then postdoctoral fellowship in 1983 in Human Genetic Center, University of Texas, USA. He was the lecturer of Human Genetics Unit, ISI Kolkata, ISI Kolkata from 1983 to 1987, and then Associate Professor of Anthropology and Human Genetics Unit, ISI Kolkata from 1987 to 1991, and then Professor of the same department till 2004. He was the professor of human genetics unit ISI from 2004 to 2010. He acted as a professor of biological sciences, Indian Institute 
Science, Education and Research, that is IZAR, Mohanpur, from 2009 to 2010. And later, in 2010, joined as a director of NIBMG Kollani. Professor Mojumdar has his expertise in human genetics and genomics, statistical genetics and population genetics. He has published about 203 research papers and he, he is also the co-author of 565 papers. He got many awards and honors. Some are Fellowship West Bengal Academy of Science in 2010, Fellowship the National Academy of Sciences India in 2007 and GD Billa Award for Scientific Research New Delhi in 2002. So today, as you know, the whole world is devastated with Corona pandemic. So our distinguished speaker has chosen a very right and relevant topic. Today he will speak on awesome geographical sweep of a mutant Corona virus with some hesitations. So no more late, I would now request Professor Mojunda to deliver his talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Maharajji and uh, Professor Midda. Thank you very much for those very kind words of introduction. Uh, indeed, I'm going to talk about the mutant coronavirus, or actually the, the coronavirus that is actually creating so much of havoc uh, throughout the world, not just in our country, but throughout the world. Um, so this is, this is what my topic is, and uh, I hope that I will be able to convey to you uh, some of the work that we have been doing with respect to this coronavirus. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides here and go directly to this. Um, uh, I, th there was an introduction about Journal of Genetics, which uh, again was founded by Haldane, where some of these host pathogen interaction uh, data or results were published, and uh, I, I don't want to spend any time on that right now. So I'm going to talk about selective sweep. Uh, th this, this study, first of all, I must mention, was uh, conducted along with a large number of people. And uh, there are seven people with whom I've done this work. Uh, most of these, uh, most of the work, the actual work was done by them. And they not only did the work, but also provided a large number of ideas. Among these seven, the, entire, the, the major ideas came from uh, Dr. Nidhan Biswas who uh, was a former PhD student of mine and now my colleague at the Indian, uh, at the uh, National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. So uh, this is this is done with uh, a bunch of uh, students and grand students, I may say so. Um, so this, this is really, uh, I'm sentimentally very attached to this particular work and it is my great pleasure to present this work to you. So if we uh, look at uh, uh, the coronavirus and the spread of this pandemic, in, uh, on December 30th uh, of last year, uh, what had happened was that uh, there's a place in China called Wuhan and uh, a cluster of 27 pneumonia-like cases were reported and these were of unknown etiology. That means the causative organism for this un uh, pneumonia-like syndrome uh, was not known. Um, on January 1st, uh, there's a, uh, Wuhan is also known for a very big seafood market where they sell a large number of fish and other uh, animals that are harvested from the sea. It has a large seafood market. Uh, it's a wholesale market and uh, uh, that market was closed on January 1st, 2020, primarily because uh, some of their workers got infected with this particular uh, coronavirus. We now know it's a coronavirus. At that time, uh, it wasn't even diagnosed properly, except that they had very they had symptoms that were like pneumonia. Uh, this particular uh, coronavirus was very quickly identified and isolated on January seventh, within about seven to eight days after uh, this cluster of cases arose. It was the actual cause organism which is a novel coronavirus was actually isolated and then within three days the entire sequence the genome sequence of the coronavirus uh, was sequenced the genome of the coronavirus was sequenced and the genome of the coronavirus is uh, 30,000 uh, bases long this is like a sentence with 30,000 alphabets and all of the alphabets um, uh, were aligned and uh, we know the the sequence in which these alphabets appear and this is an RNA virus, and therefore the four alphabets that 
uh, lie side by side on this uh, long string of alphabets is A, U, G, and C. These are the four alphabets of the RNA. And this is an RNA virus. Um, very soon, uh, it didn't take too long. It took about uh, 13 to 15 days. Within about two weeks, uh, this particular coronavirus or, uh, yeah, the coronavirus traveled outside of uh, China. So it became, it crossed the global boundary and uh, moved into Thailand, where the first case outside of China was detected, and this was on January 13th. Um, I'm not going to read uh, every one of them. I, I want to highlight a few things. Uh, so this this was this was uh, the the human to human. It wasn't known at that time how this particular coronavirus is transmitted. There was human to human transmission, and a human being got infected with the coronavirus, and then this human being infected another human being. So that's called human to human trans uh, transmission. It wasn't known at that time whether there was any human to human transmission, and it was early in January or middle of January when uh, it, it became known that there is human to human transmission. Um, I'm going to skip a few things and come to the end of January. In the at the end of January, the um, uh, coronavirus had spread far and wide. It started as an outbreak of 27 cases, as a cluster of cases in Wuhan, and uh, quickly uh, crossed the national boundaries. First spread into Thailand, or at least detected in Thailand, and um, by within a month, it spread all over the world. And the WHO called it a pandemic, which essentially means that it has crossed. Um, geographical boundaries and spread uh, throughout the world and sort of uh, uh, in a, in a pan geographical region uh, so it was it was declared as a pan pandemic and uh, there was a major concern and it was declared as a public health emergency primarily because lots of people were getting infected many people were dying and there was no way that you could contain the virus it was, it was spreading like wildfire um, so it was. Uh, so they actually didn't declare that as a WHO didn't World Health Organization did not declare that as a pandemic yet. Uh, they they essentially declared that as a public health emergency. They waited for another two months uh, to declare that as a pandemic. And on March 11th, it was declared as a pandemic. And as we know, on March 24th, we uh, in India went into lockdown and so on and so forth. So essentially. Um, uh, to make sure that the virus does not spread, but more importantly, to make sure that the hospitals have uh, beds and so on, um, uh, ventilators, beds, and these kinds of things that are required to manage this particular infection were became available. So there was a lot of mobilization of beds and um, and and uh, ventilators, etc., from various hospitals from various parts of India, and the lockdown actually. Uh, helped in a major way manage this particular disease. Otherwise, many more people would probably have been dead in India. Uh, the number of global cases, and this is this is not the most recent. It is on the 2nd of November that I la last visited this particular place called the, uh, this particular website called the Coronavirus Research Resource Center that's maintained by the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And as you can see that about 9 million cases in the US, these are not deaths. These are people who are infected, uh, 9 million cases, 8 million cases in India, and so on and so forth. The uh, percent of uh, the proportion of infected people, proportion of people infected with uh, the coronavirus who are dying is about 1.8 to 2%. So 2% of each of these figures would actually have been dead because of uh, COVID-19. So it, it, the major point is that it is infecting people all across the world, across all countries. And as you can see that um, it, is, it is infecting in very large numbers in all countries of the world. So it's truly a pandemic and it is uh, creating a lot of uh, disturbance and havoc uh, throughout the world. Like I said, that SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the name of the no novel coronavirus, um, is um, is an RNA virus, so it is uh, it is made of RNA. A, U, G, and C are the four alphabets. If it was a DNA virus, it would be T, G, and C. It's uh, a RNA virus, but also it's a single-stranded uh, positive sense RNA virus. And I'm not going to explain in any detail positive sense. A yeah, positive sense is like messenger RNA, so it's like a messenger RNA RNA messenger RNA virus. 
Uh, and its uh, genome length is 30,000 uh, bases. So essentially, it's like 30,000 alphabets uh, strung together side by side. Uh, A, U, G, and C are the four alphabets. Uh, and that's the length of the genome of uh, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this, uh, these 30,000 bases, of course, the virus um, produces uh, some proteins and so on. So, um, but interestingly enough, as, as many of you may know, those of you who are uh, in the area of, or who are studying biology would know uh, that the virus is a very funny organism. It's neither a living matter and living organism, not a non-living matter. It is not a living organism primarily because it cannot, rep, uh, it, ca it cannot, unless it, um, uh, you know, hijacks some, it enters a host cell and hijacks some uh, machinery of the host cell, it cannot reproduce by itself. One cardinal feature of a living organism is the ability to reproduce and viruses don't reproduce by itself unless it is uh, able to enter into a host cell and hijack uh, make use of some of the cellular machinery of the host cell uh, to its own advantage in order to replicate. And uh, replication is like re reproduction. So a virus uh, essentially uh, cannot be thought thought about uh, thought of as a as a living organism. On the other hand, it has uh, many characteristics of a living organism. It has the RNA. Uh, the RNA contains uh, many structural proteins, etc., which all express themselves after they enter the host cell or um, or some, some of it express themselves before they enter the host cell otherwise they wouldn't be able to enter but most of it uh, expresses themselves uh, before after they enter the host cell so they in in any case they hijack the cell um, the machine cellular machinery of the host in order to uh, replicate so this uh, th these 30000 bases encode about uh, not about it encode 29 structural and non structural proteins and uh, of which the most important uh, it's what's what are these proteins some of the classes of these proteins are written there but uh, the protein that we are most interested in is called the spike glycoprotein so it's a protein that's expressed in the uh, sort of surface of the virus and those spikes that you see uh, and and picture of the coronavirus is all over those spikes that you see on the circle um, outside of the coronavirus, that's a spike protein and uh, that's a glycose protein. Again, I will not explain what a glycoprotein is, but it is a protein that's expressed um, outside of, uh, you know, like in those spikes outside of the coronavirus. Um, one of the things that, like I said, that it wasn't clear whether there is human to human transmission but it became clear early on that there was human to human transmission. What was also unknown is that from where did this particular coronavirus um, where, um, evolve? How did this coronavirus evolve and which was the sort of most ancient organism where this uh, coronavirus um, made its uh, home? So uh, this was this was uh, this is very interesting. Uh, it was found that the bat uh, has a coronavirus and the bat coronavirus was sequenced and the human coronavirus has already been sequenced, as you know. And if you look at alphabet by alphabet, there is 90, 96% sequence identity between the bat coronavirus and the human coronavirus. Now, if there is a large sequence identity, you tend to believe that these are all very close relatives. And therefore, one believed that the human coronavirus came from the uh, bat coronavirus. But did it come directly from the bat? Because we often, do, we don't usually get in uh, you know, contact with the bat. Uh, very few humans get in contact with the bat. So was it a direct transmission from the bat to the human? Uh, turns out, and again, this is a, a matter of speculation, and I'll tell you the interesting way in which, which uh, this find was made and why the speculation may be correct. So one, one believes that oftentimes um, there, when there is cross-species transmission, so bat is a species, humans are another species, so there is cross-species transmission. When there is cross-species transmission, there is an intermediate host as well before it hits the human. Uh, in this particular case, what was found was that uh, uh, in China, again in China, in the sort of uh, not in deep forest, but in the periphery of a forest, uh, it was found that two pangolins uh, were dead. Pangolin is like the anteater, 
two pangolins were dead and uh, the, uh, somebody just accidentally found two pang pangolins who were dead and these pangolins had a lot of froth coming out of the mouth so it looked like they had uh, problems with the lungs because when you have problems with the lungs then you have a lot of froth that comes out of your mouth so uh, there was a uh, uh, speculation that this, these uh, um, the pangolins had some some kind of um, infection uh, of the lungs and so they brought brought it to the veterinary hospital and dissected the lungs isolated and indeed dissected the lungs and found that it was uh, infected and they identified the infected organism it was a coronavirus that it infected and then they sequenced the coronavirus and it was found that uh, the pangolin coronavirus and the human coronavirus were 91% uh, sequence identity was 91%. So alphabet by alphabet, 91% of the 100, um, uh, 100 alphabets that we are reading between the um, pangolin coronavirus and the human coronavirus, 91% uh, of them were identical. So the current uh, thinking is that uh, the SARS-CoV-2, um, the human coronavirus, arose in the bat. And from the bat, there was an intermediate host called the pangolin, which is the anteater, and then it eventually came to the human. Uh, did the hum is this the first coronavirus of the human? Certainly not. There have been other coronavirus in the human, um, and most of them are actually, uh, you know, don't cause us any 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 major problems. Don't cause us any um, uh, fever or any any of these symptoms that we see with the current coronavirus. So, but at least there are uh, two um, coronaviruses that that are that did produce a lot of symptoms and deaths. So um, uh, these two coronaviruses are called the SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS coronavirus. The SARS-CoV-1 again arose in China in 2003. Um, it became an uh, it was a major outbreak. It did not become an epidemic, and certainly it did not become a pandemic. It was contained before then. The SARS-CoV-1 um, is is uh, one major one other one human coronavirus that actually kills a number of people. Uh, the um, uh, sequence identity with the with SARS-CoV-2 is only eighty percent. Then there is the MERS coronavirus, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, uh, which arose in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia, and uh, it, it was it was a great killer. It killed. Uh, about 35, 34% of the people it infected. So uh, the, uh, the SARS coronavirus killed about 11%. The MERS coronavirus killed 34%. And the SARS-CoV-2 kills only about 1.8 to 2%, which means that SARS-CoV-2 is a very kind coronavirus. It does not kill. It infects a large number of people, but actually does not kill a large number of people. And then there is a common cold coronavirus with which the SARS-CoV-2 only has a 50% uh, sequence identity. So with the human, other human coronaviruses, the, uh, the identity is not so great. But with the pangolin coronavirus or the bat coronavirus, there is indeed a lot of sequence identity. Uh, we, uh, I want to draw your attention to a specific position. Uh, on the spike protein, like I said, there are there are these one, two, three, four, so on up to 30,000 30, 30, alphabets. And uh, if you look at on the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, if we look at uh, a specific position called 614, that 614 has uh, a specific or codes encodes a specific uh, amino acid, which is called aspartic acid, generally denoted by the alphabet D. And what you see here uh, is that this D alphabet uh, at that particular position is present in all of these uh, these coronaviruses. And I'm going to talk about the change in that particular position from D to something else. Uh, and that's the mutant coronavirus that I shall be talking about. Uh, again, just to quickly recapitulate, viruses cannot survive without their hosts. Uh, to replicate, they have to enter the host cells and use host cell machinery. Uh, viruses don't want to kill their hosts because uh, unless they find a host cell, enter a host cell, they cannot re replicate. So if they want to procreate, if they want to leave their footprints in the next generations, they need to reproduce and therefore uh, they need to enter a host cell. If they cannot enter a host cell, they are dead. They, they cannot uh, reproduce. So they really want to reproduce and therefore they don't want to kill their hosts. 
So uh, that that's their stra strategy. Uh, so the host mortality, like I said, with SARS-CoV-1 was 11 percent, with MERS 34 percent, and with SARS-CoV-2 uh, less than 3 percent. So it's about now the current estimates are about 1.82 percent. So SARS-CoV-2, um, this this is a, a typing error here. The last one should be SARS-CoV-2, which is less than three percent, and that's um, uh, so. Uh, so I said that you know SARS-CoV-2 is a kind coronavirus. Indeed, it's kind because it it infects many people but does not kill. Uh, the SARS coronavirus, of course, as I said, uh, infects the human, and there is human to human transmission. Uh, it infects the human and it infects uh, certain specific organs of the body in larger numbers than other organs. The uh, preferred um, organ uh, for the SARS-CoV-2, this particular coronavirus is the lungs. Um, so they, they will go and happily infect the lungs, cells of the lungs, and, uh, uh, and remain there and cause damage to the lung. And uh, they eventually, they, sometimes uh, they can even kill the host. So uh, that that that's where the host cell host uh, preference is host cell preference is for by the coronavirus. But I must also say that it's not just the lungs; it also infects many organs of the body and many many organs of the body. Um, so it infects the brain, it infects uh, uh, it infects the pancreas, it infects uh, the gut. Uh, the intestine and so you may have heard this that people who uh, have been infected with the coronavirus also uh, started uh, you know had a stomach upset started passing stool and so on and so forth so this is all uh, a consequence of the um, uh, of the infection by the uh, coronavirus uh, this particular spike protein I, I do need to spend a little bit time on the spike protein the spike protein um, uh, is is very interesting in that that it has um, uh, it it has two subunits it has two uh, portions one portion is called S1 the protein is called S one portion is called S1 the other portion is called S2 S1 plays a role in attaching the virus to the host cell so before the virus can enter the host cell it needs to attach itself to the host cell and then uh, somehow find its way through the cell membrane of the host into the host cell, into the uh, inside of the cell of the host. So this particular subunit one, uh, the first subunit, is involved in uh, recognition, is in, involved in binding and recognition, so that the the, the um, based on the protein that's expressed on the surface of the um, cell uh, of, of this particular cell, it will go and attach itself to a host cell. And this attachment is of the spike protein of the coronavirus is done to a specific receptor, uh, which is called the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2 uh, or, uh, or ACE2. It goes and binds to the receptor of ACE2. And ACE2 has been implicated in various kinds of cardiac functions, the functions of the heart, and so on. Um, and the uh, second subunit, which is the S2 domain of, uh, of the S coronavirus, the second subunit is involved in uh, facilitating the fusion of the um, uh, virus with the host. And this fusion is absolutely required such that the, such, such that the virus, uh, the host can actually permit the virus to break its cell wall and allow it to enter. But it won't won't allow it to enter until it has foolproof evidence that it actually can um, can can um, facilitate the fusion of the viral protein with the with the human protein. Right now, um, I think that there is no confusion in anybody's mind that S1 is uh, plays the role of attachment and S2 plays the role of recognition of the uh, spike pro uh, spike uh, pro um, spike protein of the virus. Um, so that that's that's what the spike protein does, and it needs uh, to be the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit. These need to be broken. These need to be uh, cut into two sub separate subunits because uh, when the uh, these two are together, when the two subunits are together, the S uh, protein is actually non-functional. It cannot function. So for it to function, it has to be broken into two subunits, and this. Uh, breaking or cutting is called cleavage, and so there are proteins that actually cleave. 
Um, what are the proteins that cleave? Uh, the most prominent protein that cleaves this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, um, uh, is called Tempris-2. Uh, so that's a, a protein that actually helps the virus cut the cell membrane. And Tempris-2 um, is, is, of course, uh, um, not of course, is known to be a serine protease. A protease is actually Q protein so uh, this particular serine protease uh, is able to um, is able to cleave uh, and, and, and cleave the uh, host protein the host cell wall and allow the virus to enter the host cell once the virus enters the host cell of course everything takes over and uh, the virus is able to replicate inside the host cell the uh, partners like i um, told you just now uh, um, are two pro uh, is a protein that's called Tempris 2. This Tempris 2 is a serine protease, meaning that it, uh, it's a protein that chews up other specific proteins. And uh, this, this, this particular protein helps the virus enter the host cell. And once the virus enters the host cell, it takes care of, uh, care of itself. So um, right now, for example, even if, it take care of it, even if it takes care of itself, we uh, need to be able to understand where, where it uh, attaches itself and it attaches itself to the angiotensin converting enzyme, as I said. Uh, so uh, this is a serine protease, and this is present in the uh, wild type, meaning the commonly uh, available coronavirus, not necessarily the mutant coronavirus. So um, we will talk about uh, the mutant coronavirus. Okay, maybe at this point, I'll tell you what the mutant, mutant coronavirus is. I talked to you about this particular position 614. At this position 614 of the spike protein, there is an amino acid called aspartic acid or aspartate, as uh, people oftentimes uh, like to write. So aspartate and uh, this 614 position then gets mutated, gets changed, uh, and uh, the new protein that's formed is called um, and the, the um, new protein that's uh, new, not new protein, the new amino acid that's formed is called glycine. So it, there's a change from aspartic acid to glycine at this particular position, uh, 614. So the mutant coronavirus is the one that has uh, the glycine uh, amino acid at position number 614. So this is this is the mutant coronavirus that we'll be talking about. In, in some detail. Um, all of this, all of our work was facilitated by um, the availability of uh, sequence data. And the sequence data have been, are being gathered uh, for uh, many, uh, over a decade now, over 10 years by um, an organization. And they have constructed uh, a web, not a website, a data database called GIS AID. And this database actually has sequences of viruses that are very similar to the influenza virus. So this is this is influenza and influenza-like virus database. And the coronavirus, this particular coronavirus, it create, causes uh, symptoms such as uh, like similar to influenza or pneumonia. And therefore, this is this, this uh, sequence uh, sequences of th these particular coronaviruses are deposited to GISAID and GISAID was interested in uh, getting hold of such uh, um, getting hold of such uh, sequences, and we were able to analyze these sequences and draw certain kinds of inferences. So um, this was, as I told you, that the virus arose or was first detected uh, in January, uh, early, very early in January, and then uh, it spread throughout the world. And GISAID was actually sequencing. No, they were not sequencing. Sequencing was being done in various parts of the world. Wherever these viruses were being detected, their genomes were being sequenced, but the genome sequences were being deposited in this particular uh, data repository called uh, GISAID. Um, and and uh, so those of us who are interested in looking at these sequences, changes in the sequences, uh, we uh, relied on this GIS AID and uh, the curated database, a little bit uh, polished database of the same data is called the next strain. So we look at next strain because that has polished data after you remove uh, certain kinds of artifactual uh, experimental artifacts. And uh, in in um, in April, we analyzed the data. In the, by April, there was about three thousand four five hundred uh, sequences that were deposited to this particular database, and we downloaded sequences and 
started to analyze these sequences ourselves. One of the things that uh, we identified was with respect to this particular uh, this particular mutant, which is uh, the as ascorbic acid to glycine change at position number 614. Uh, very interesting. Of the, so as we were looking at these data, we noticed something accidentally, so to say, um, uh, and, and that observation became a seminal observation because uh, um, subsequent to ours, the same observation was noted uh, in Iceland, uh, was made, made by a group of scientists in Iceland. And then there was another uh, uh, collaborative group of scientists working in the US and uh, in the UK who came together, who combined their efforts in order to understand the coronavirus. And they also independently made exactly the uh, same observation or same inference um, as ours. So what was our uh, inference? Our inference based on these 3,636 3, uh, sequences that were collected until April and our, this, we published this in May. It, it takes a little bit of time to publish a study. So um, uh, in by April, so many sequences uh, were deposited and we analyzed these sequences. And what we found was, as we look at the spread of this coronavirus, one would expect that the ancestral strain, which is the aspartic acid uh, strain, and you will recall that I showed you another slide, uh, top right-hand corner of which I showed you that there was a D, 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 D at that 614 position in various organisms, including, um, uh, including the bat and the coronavirus and the human. So essentially, uh, the ancestral types also had D at that particular position, 614, and therefore the evolution of this uh, coron coronavirus is not very, um, uh, not very new. Uh, well, we understood the evolution and the spread. When we looked at the spread, it something amazing turned out. What turned out was that it was not the ancestral uh, strain or ancestral subtype that was actually spreading throughout the world. It was the mutant subtype, the 614 glycine mutant. Okay, so um, uh, like I said, that there were two uh, other groups that independently found this. One was from uh, one was from uh, Iceland, and they made the same observation as ours that the mutant coronavirus was the one that was spreading very very rapidly uh, throughout the world, but not the uh, ancestral coronavirus. And that was that's kind of uh, odd because unless there is a Darwinian natural selection advantage, uh, a mutant virus usually. Uh, cannot cannot increase in frequencies and cannot uh, transmit itself so uh, efficiently and so well. Um, the, the other group was called, published their paper, that's Corber et al. That, that was a collaborative group between the US and UK. So uh, our paper was published in May, the Iceland paper was published in June, the um, UK US paper was published in July. So that's very in very quick succession. Um, other groups also made exactly the same observation as ours. Um, when this this uh, you know the the, the uh, coronavirus came to humans from the bat via the pangolin, there was uh, a, um, a one particular type of the coronavirus, and they had all uh, that coronavirus had the same sequence, so to say, and that coronavirus was uh, named as the O coronavirus O O subtype. Um, by the time we were looking at the data, as a matter of fact, by, the, by about uh, January, February, uh, there arose many more subtypes, and these subtypes were named as uh, B, B1, B2, A, 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 A2, A2, A, A, A3, and so on and so forth. Uh, most of these subtypes had actually the ancestral uh, amino acid uh, at that particular position, which is a 614 position. So. Uh, all of these, so in, in all, there are 11 uh, different subtypes, including the ancestral subtype, uh, except for these two, A2 and A2A, all of the remaining subtypes have the um, uh, ancestral amino acid, which is uh, aspartic acid. So the, the two mutant viruses that contain uh, glycine at that position, 614, is the, are, are the two subtypes that um, have the selective advantage and that has been able to spread throughout the world very, very efficiently. And this is the observation that we actually made. 
So if I can show you how we make these observations, so let me explain this diagram to you. This diagram is called a phylogenetic tree. It is, uh, it, it, is it is a documentation of how um, the virus has evolved. It's very dense. The tips of this circle, the outer ring of this circle has uh, small dots and these dots, uh, each dot represents uh, one individual of a corona, one individual coronavirus sequence. And uh, this is color coded, and the color coding is that uh, the blues uh, are the A2A coronavirus, and uh, the green um, or the sky blue is the A2 coronavirus. So A2 and A2A, you will remember, are the mutant coronaviruses. The remaining viruses all have um, aspartic acid at position number 614. So you already see that by 31st of March, um, the original uh, subtype was the subtype O, uh, which had uh, aspartic acid at position number 614. And from there uh, arose uh, uh, other subtypes and A2 and A2A subtypes also arose from there. But they have overtaken and they uh, were able to overtake the original um, uh, subtype, which is the O subtype, and they were able to overtake and spread itself extremely efficiently throughout the world. And by March 31st, we see that uh, about 50% uh, or maybe a little over 50% of uh, people who are infected with the coronavirus are infected with the mutant coronavirus, not the ancestral one. Uh, if you look at me, uh, these, are, these are essentially both the same picture. Uh, except that on the right hand side, I have clubbed, um, you know, strains in order to just show which is the mutant and which is the um, uh, original, the ancestral type. So if we keep our uh, focus on the right hand uh, side, what one sees is that um, in 31st of on 31st of March, the mutant coronavirus was about uh, 51, 52 percent. By uh, early May, and this is just uh, allowing for evolution of two by two months. By early May, this was already like 70, 75 percent, 70 percent, and by July it was like 80 percent. So 80 percent of the people who were infected are infected by the mutant coronavirus, not the original coronavirus. And this is a, a very, very surprising finding uh, in the sense that this usually would not happen. One doesn't expect this. And this happens when there is a strong selective advantage to the mutant coronavirus. And indeed, there was a there is a, um, a huge uh, selective advantage of the uh, mutant coronavirus, as one sees that between January and July, uh, when the, the uh, with from from about like um, 0. 0.00001 percent to about 80 percent spread uh, throughout the world. And that's that's mind boggling and that's very striking. So the question that we asked is, uh, why is this? Uh, so this, this the, up until here is what we published in that uh, paper that we published in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. This was also the observation of the other two groups, but the other two groups were um, able to do some cell biology work. And they showed that if you had this mutation, uh, the 614G mutation, not you, if the coronavirus had the 614G mutation, they were able to infect human cells better. Uh, they were able to, uh, they were more infective and therefore they probably transmitted better. But uh, the mechanism wasn't worked out. The mechanism, we still don't know what the mechanism is, but uh, we um, asked this question, what is the reason? What is the mechanism by which uh, this particular uh, mutant coronavirus, uh, the one that um, uh, has this uh, 614G glycine at this particular position is able to do this? So we looked at, uh, so we, we started doing some experiments ourselves and we looked at the literature and we now believe that uh, we have a story to tell. And that story wouldn't come about until we made another observation. And this is the second observation. And uh, please remember that my title also has the word hesitation. And so let me explain what that, where that word comes from. What is the hesitation? So uh, if you look at uh, the mutant coronavirus and spread of the uh, coronavirus, what we have one sees is that the coronavirus is actually spread throughout the world. So let me explain what these two figures are. The top panel pertains to Europe. The bottom one pertains to North America. The um, x-axis has uh, months. So these are months. And uh, each month uh, has a lot, very large number of dots, uh, each dot representing an individual. 
So what one sees is uh, essentially from this graph is how the coronavirus has spread both in Europe and in, and in North America over time. What one finds, so red is the mutant coronavirus, the um, other colors are non-mutant coronavirus. As a matter of fact, there's only one other color, which is green. The green is the uh, non-mutant uh, or the white type, as they say, the original, the ancestral. And the red is the derived type, the evolved type, which is uh, the mutant coronavirus. So um, what one sees is that uh, the it ends in July, the... Um, x-axis ends in July. So by July, um, every one of the individuals who was getting infected or who have has been in, had been infected, uh, both in Europe and North America, 100% of them were being infected by the uh, mutant coronavirus. When we look at global data, we also uh, categorized it by categorized it by regions. At, just as Europe and North America, we also looked at East Asia. This is like Japan, South China, India, and all of those places. And of course, one sees that there is a very striking difference between East Asia and Europe and North America. Europe and North America are Caucasian, people who are called as Caucasian, uh, and East Asians are uh, mostly non-Caucasian individuals. They are Mongoloids and so on. So uh, uh, East Asians uh, are non-Caucasian. So in, uh, in, in individuals, in Caucasian individuals, it's this uh, mutant coronavirus is able to infect itself so well that 100% of the people are infected with the mutant coronavirus. But the mutant coronavirus is not able to uh, infect people in East Asia, the non-Caucasian so well, as you can see. There is some hesitation in terms of infectivity uh, because you don't see as much red as green in East Asia. We uh, asked ourselves this question, would um, the mutant coronavirus ever reach 100% in East Asia? And as a matter of fact, we believe that it will given time. But it's there is some hesitation, but that hesitation will eventually be overcome and it will become 100% of the mutant coronavirus. So we uh, did some statistical work. We fitted some... Uh, appropriate models and essentially what we see is that both Europe and North America they have uh, attained near 100 percent or um, actually 100 percent and East Asia which is the third line which is the bottom most line is also the cur uh, curve is increasing the slope of this line is also positive uh, and as we can see that is uh, becoming asymptotic to uh, 100 so it will eventually reach 100 the mutant coronavirus will also reach 100 uh, percent in East Asia, but as of now, there is some hesitation and it is hesitating. The next question that we asked is, why is it hesitating? Why is it that uh, in Caucasians it's able to uh, spread itself so well, infect the Caucasians so well, but it's not able to infect uh, the East Asians, the non-Caucasians, non um, as well as it is infecting the Caucasians. So, um, uh, what happened? Um, so, the question that we asked is, why is the coronavirus finding it difficult to sweep through the non-Caucasian populations of East Asia? Uh, like I said that, uh, well, we considered several possibilities that the ACE protein in the angiotensin converting enzyme, pro that is the protein that's expressed on the human cell sur surface, and that's where the spike protein comes and at attaches itself. So if there is, uh, if, the, if there are non-Caucasians don't express the ACE protein as much, then uh, maybe the uh, coronavirus is not able to attach itself so well to the non-Caucasian host cell. We ruled this out. Again, I'm not going to go into the details. We looked at various kinds of polymorphisms or changes in um, the ACE uh, gene, ACE2 gene, and uh, that, that's on the X chromosome, ACE2 gene. And we found that uh, we couldn't explain um, um, based on the non-Caucasians having less amount of uh, ACE protein on the uh, surface of their cells. So this particular hypothesis was ruled out. Um, the second hypothesis was not second hypothesis, another observation that we made with respect to the coronavirus was that once this 614 aspartic acid changed to <coughs> glycine, that particular nucleotide change that led to the amino acid change actually resulted in another new cleavage site. <coughs> the cleavage site, uh, just to recall, you remember that I talked to you about two subunits, S1 and S2. The S1 subunit is meant for attachment. The S2 subunit is meant for cell, post cell entry, fusion. So the um, uh, it needs to be cleaved because when they are joined, uh, the, the protein is inactive. 
So when the, when there is cleavage, uh, both uh, there is a cleavage site, uh, which is the Tempress 2 cleavage site, which is present both in the uh, 614D, the wild type, and also in the mutant. But the mutant has an additional cleavage site, which is a neutrophil elastase cleavage site. And this particular neutrophil elastase cleavage site allows more uh, uh, entry, uh, more um, uh, viruses to enter the host cell. So like if, if you're trying to enter a room and if there is one door, uh, only so many people can enter. But if there are two doors to that room, if another door opens up, then more and more people can enter. That is essentially the analogy. So this particular mutant virus has opened up a new door because of which more viruses can enter the host cell. So that's the beauty uh, of this new coronavirus. And we did some cell line experiments on that. I'm not going to, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip that. So the mutant coronavirus, because it has opened a new door, is able to infect uh, cells better. Uh, I'm also going to skip this. This is uh, this is a matter of uh, you know, finessing. So I'll come to the last two minutes of my talk. The question is that uh, it is it, the, the new door, the second cleavage site, is opened up uh, in all of the mutant viruses, yet the mutant virus is uh, not able to enter, um, you know, not able to enter so well the host protein, even though there is more and more cleavage and therefore more and more activity of the spike protein. And since there is more and more activity, more and more uh, um, uh, viruses can actually latch on to uh, the human host. Uh, because there's plenty of ACE2 receptors on the human host cell. But yet uh, in East Asia, uh, individuals in East Asia were in some ways being protected. And we looked at the literature and identified that there is an inhibitor. Uh, so the new cleavage uh, protein is called elastase. Uh, there is an inhibitor. There's a normal inhibitor of elastase, which is called alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is produced by humans. Um, there are uh, individuals who express it at normal levels, whatever the normal level is. But there are also individuals who are deficient in alpha-1 antitrypsin. And uh, by, when you are deficient in alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, you are unable to inhibit elastase. And elastase is uh, not, not necessarily a good protein. It actually uh, cuts other proteins because it is the serine protease. So uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency uh, can actually... Uh, um, uh, uh, it is caused by mutations in the alpha-1 antitrypsin gene, and there are some known mutations. So the M allele, uh, the M variant is uh, the normal variant, which produces normal levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin. But if you have a mutation that causes uh, um, the um, replacement of the M allele by another allele that we call as S, or yet another allele that we call as Z, uh, the S and Z alleles produce uh, are, func uh, are uh, function in, in the following manner that they uh, reduce the extent of um, production of the alpha-1 antitrypsin. So individuals who have the S and Z alleles, they uh, produce less um, alpha-1 antitrypsin and therefore the, alpha -1 anti the total amount of alpha-1 antitrypsin in those, those individuals are able to uh, inhibit less amount of elastase. So I put down here in the box Lower level of um, alpha-1 antitrypsin means that there is lower inhibition of neutrophil elastase. Lower inhibition would mean that there will be higher level of neutrophil elastase uh, expressed by, uh, uh, and neutrophil elastase is the cle uh, cleaving protein. So there will be, if there is higher level of neutrophil elastase, so the second door is open, and then there will be a greater level of spike protein activation because spike protein gets activated when there is cleavage. If instead of one cleavage site, there are two cleavage sites, uh, greater amounts of alpha-1 uh, greater amounts of the spike protein get activated. Higher levels of activation will mean higher levels of infectivity, and that will mean spread better spread in the population. So here is my last slide. So we will remember that lower levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin through this series of arguments leads to better spread in the population. So we thought that Europe and uh, United States or Europe and North America, people should be expressing lower level of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And that may be one reason why the uh, mutant coronavirus is able to spread itself so well. And when we looked at the data, it, it turned out to be indeed so. Uh, this is these are the three broad regions, East Asia, Europe, and North America. 
The red circles um, uh, are the uh, mute coronavirus, the uh, 614G coronavirus. The green circles re uh, refer to the um, uh, non-mutant coronavirus, uh, the 614D. And so what you one can see is that Europe and North America is full of red circles, which essentially means that it is um, every one of the individuals who is infected is infected with the mutant coronavirus, while in East Asia it's infected with the non-mutant coronavirus. Then we looked at the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency levels, and what one finds is that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, again, let me recall, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency means that there will be a better infectivity. And as you can see, this the taller the bar, the greater is the level of deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin. So many individuals in Europe and North America are alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient, and this is known, this is known from uh, various kinds of previous studies of human genetics that alpha-1 uh, people in Europe and North America has a very high level of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient alleles, S and Z. Uh, while in East Asia, in the non-Caucasians, the, the, the deficient allele is not so prevalent. And as you can see in East Asia, the proportion of people who are deficient with respect to alpha-1 antitrypsin production is very small. And that, we believe, um, is the reason why there is higher infectivity in deficient individuals. And uh, we believe that that uh, deficiency leads to better infectivity. And that's the reason why Europeans and North Americans are um, uh, infected only with the uh, mutant coronavirus. While because there is less in deficiency, the level of infectivity is lower in non-Caucasians of East Asia. And that's the reason why we see this picture. Uh, East Asia is a region, Europe is a region, North America is a region. There is some amount of uh, variability in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency proportions in each of these regions. And we've looked at that, and I'm not going to present the data to you, but by country, at the level of the country also, if you see in East Asian countries, uh, every country has much smaller amount of um, uh, except for Thailand, every country has much smaller amount of these, uh, um, of uh, deficiency, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, compared to countries in uh, Europe and North America, as these uh, bars show you. The taller the bar, the greater is the level of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So to wrap up my story, we started uh, with an observation that the mutant coronavirus is the one spreading, and that came as a surprise, primarily because uh, one expects that the original, the ancestral type will spread itself far better and not the um, mutant, mutant virus. The second, that observation uh, led to, uh, led to uh, you know, inquisitive kinds of questions and we were able to uh, eventually find that uh, the mutant coronavirus has produced an, uh, a new cleavage site called elastase. And then we said that, okay, it opens up a second door of cleavage, but then why is it that uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not able to infect as many people in East Asia? So that was the second observation that we made. And then we figured out that there is a connection between a human protein, the alpha-1 antitrypsin and uh, the uh, neutrophil elastase, which is inhibited by alpha-1 antitrypsin. And that explains what we uh, overall see at an epidemiological level. So uh, uh, observations to uh, experiments to uh, explanation is what wraps up uh, this entire gamut of studies that we have done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Mojumdar. Now it is left for a questionnaire. Dear students, if you have any question, you can put to the speaker. Students, have you any question? Hello? Maybe they're all muted. Uh, yes, yes. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you can ask. Thank you, sir. I am the shop. Sir, uh, is this discovery means this mutation have any role in discovering drug against that coronavirus? Um, no, I mean I, I I really don't think so. It uh, this is infectivity primarily. It, it, 
incidentally, we spoke that particular angle. So I, I really can't tell you that, uh, you know, whether this, our observations uh, have any any role to play in uh, in vaccines or uh, treatment. I, I That's preposterous. I don't think I would like to make that kind of a speculation right now. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Any question? Sir, one question. In yes. the chat box, uh, he has asking why Thailand has positive cases compared to other Asian countries. So if you if you looked at my last slide, which I can uh avoid. are my slides visible still? Can you see my slides? Yes? yes. Okay. So if you look at uh, the, the top panel is East Asia and on the right hand side, you have um, the alpha-1 antitrustin deficiency levels. And if you uh, if you can read those uh, names of the countries, uh, it starts with China on the top, China, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, South Korea, and then Thailand. And as you can see, the tallest bar in Southeast Asia with respect to alpha-1 antitrustin deficiency is Thailand. And we believe that uh, because of this high level of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in Thailand, the mutant virus is able to spread itself so well in Thailand compared to other, other countries in East Asia. Have I answered your question? Yeah, Any one okay. question? Students, do you have any questions on that? Yes. YouTube. Hello, sir. Can you listen? Chat box. The student actually asking. Uh, thank you for presentation. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, with current techniques, has there been experiments? With to edit mutant in character 14, possibly reverse a so, so, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that uh, have we used the CRISPR technology to make a normal individual deficient or to make a deficient individual normal? I guess that's the question that's being asked. Now, the, uh, problem with, the problem with uh, uh, using CRISPR uh, technology in order to correct a genetic defect uh, is that unless a genetic defect is due to a unique mutation, it becomes extremely difficult. Uh, the alpha-1 antitrypsin gene is a large gene, and there are many uh, mutations in that specific gene that lead to deficiency. I only talked about two of those uh, mutations, S and Z, which are most uh, prevalent in many po many pop the most prevalent mutations that causes deficiency. But there are many other mutations that cause deficiency. So this is uh, CRISPR technology. Uh, is really not appropriate for uh, the for correcting alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. Sir, another question uh, from Sukriti Mighty. He is asking, sir, is this true that the Indian population has stronger immu immune response at the so high recovery rate? So, I uh, honestly speaking, I don't think that uh, the uh, systematic collection, uh, systematically collected data really show that Indians are able to recover better than people in other parts of the world. The mortality rates have also been by and large the same. Uh, about the 100 people who are infected with the coronavirus, about, uh, um, you know, 18 or 20, uh, sorry, 2.8 or 2, about 2 people are dying. And that 2% is uh, across the board, across all uh, countries. So this is uh, really not true that Indians are being protected 
uh, and have all have a different mortality. Uh, I think it's widely the same across countries. Have said that it's possible that Indians elicit better immune uh, immune response to the after infection by the virus, by the virus, but um, yeah, there's no significant evidence of that yet. Hello. Yes. Any more question? Students? Okay, sir, I, uh, I think you wrap up this because uh, sir has meeting from 4 o'clock. So uh, any meeting, any questions uh, afterwards, uh, okay. we will uh, send through email, sir. Uh, say them to, so, so that sir can immediately answer. Sure. So it was a great pleasure, Maharaji, uh, that you know you asked me to give this talk, and uh, I wish that I could be there um, in Krishna uh, Mission with the bait to actually give this talk, but uh, I wasn't able to because of the same coronavirus. <laughs> yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> nicely explained, sir. Nice. Sure. Sir, of thanks, sir. sir uh, uh, professor, uh, Doctor Medha, please. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so if there is no question, I would now request Dr. Bishwajit Ghosh, Associate Professor, Department of Botany of our College, to give his vote of thanks. Dr. Ghosh. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to express our sincere thanks to Professor Patapati Majumdar, a distinguished professor, President of Indian Academy of Science, a former director of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Kalani, for giving his excellent talk on awesome geographical switch of a mutant coronavirus from hesitation. We are really enriched from his talk. And thank you, Professor Majumdar. I want to thank to our principal, uh, Kamala, uh, Swami Kamalastanando Maharaj, for organizing this program. And finally, I would like to thank all faculty members and students for their success. On my uh, turn, I also would like to thank all of the students for, uh, for uh, joining my uh, talk. And uh, I hope that uh, I've been uh, clear and uh, they have understood my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, sir. sir now we are leaving, sir. You please sir, rest okay. and after the course, then again. Yes, yes. Sir, sir. Yes, rest, this sir. now it is rain. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you.